Well, hello there. And I would like to say this is quite an exciting opportunity. They do say that what's meant for you will not go by you. And I guess maybe this is one of those examples now. But I'd like to start off by saying that music is wonderful. Noise isn't generally wonderful. And bagpipes are the missing link between music and the noise. <laughs> now, bagpiping is traditionally what the Scots do. When you see a picture of bagpipes, you're like, yes, the lone piper of Hogmanay, fantastic. But actually, we weren't the first. We're the ones who improved it. But as far as I'm aware, the original design actually came from Greece. But yeah, they would have had one drone, this one here, and possibly one other tenor. So on the bagpipes, there are three drones. It looks scary, but it's not. This one, this great big long one here, gives you the bass. It's called the bass drone, and it has the lowest sound. It's usually tuned to an A, but not a concert pitch A. And then we have the two tenor drones. These are tuned two octaves above your bass drone, and they give a nice high pitch ee. Now, the best way to tune them is to try and stop them from wavering, but we'll get around to that in a wee second. Then this bit here is what your fingers go on, and then this bit here is what you blow into to fill up the bag. But yeah, in their original form, they would only have had maybe one or two drones, and for some unknown reason, they migrated over to Scotland. And that was all quite good for a long time, but then unfortunately disaster happened. The English took over, kilts were banned, bagpipes banned, oh it was terrible. But it was okay, because over in the islands, so we're talking about particularly the Isle of Skye and the Western Isles, piping really took off, because what else are you going to do when you're marooned on an island? And so during the 1700s, piping really developed, and this is where we can see this design coming out of it. And interestingly, at that time there was a lot of folklore. People were very much into fairies, goblins, all that kind of thing. And the fairy flag is one of those relics that dates from that time. It's currently in Dunvegan Castle over in the Isle of Skye. But around about that time it was the Macleods on Skye who really developed the bagpipe and they wrote a lot of tunes. Originally at this time, they would compose tunes, not the kind of music that you generally hear nowadays, but a type of music called Pibroch, or Culmore, which means heavy music, big music, as opposed to Culbeg, which is what we play nowadays. Now this kind of music is almost like the classical music for bagpipes. It's generally written as a lament to your, your chieftain of your clan who died tragically in some <coughs> clan battle. And it comes in numerous parts. You've got the first part, which is called the ground, and it is a very slow piece. It has a slight melody, but not really. And then you get all your variations. Now this is like the ground, but you're adding in maybe another few notes. You're adding in different movements. And then gradually you build it up, build it up, and it gets to this climax, and then it stops it suddenly goes back to the ground. So in that sense, it is like a jumble of notes for folk who don't know it. But for experienced pipers who are well-tuned, it's pretty good. But as well as doing that, they also decided to start writing happier tunes. That's what I was playing in the welcome area, but it's generally what you'll hear from pipe bands around the world. And it's the light music, R jigs, reels, hornpipes, marches through space, all of that kind of light music. That's the stuff that we're really into. Not many pipers nowadays will go into Culbeg, uh, sorry, Culmore, which is the heavy music. That's generally reserved for the folk who do Highland Games and take it very seriously and are very proud to be a piper. Not to say I'm not, but it's just not my jam. But yes, yeah, so, so these are the pipes. This is kind of how it came to be. When the English cleared off and pipes and kilts and everything was allowed again, it migrated across Scotland and really sparked off a kind of generation of pipers. And that was quite interesting because in the country, you can almost cut a line down the Great Highland Fault Line. You've got the East and the West. And interestingly, the piping is very different between those two regions. 
I never really was aware of it until I started learning myself from my dad, who was taught by the West Coast Pipers, and they play certain movements slightly differently to East Coast. So once you're well tuned into it, you can pick up the slight differences and say, oh, that's a West Coast Piper there, and nope, that's definitely an East Coast person. So it's quite interesting. But yeah, for a long time then, piping was only really found in the army. That was the only place you could keep going with your piping. And the army really refined the instrument. They very much set the standard for this is how piping should be done. And even nowadays, that still exists. Um, there's two books, the Scots Guards Volume 1, Scots Guards Volume 2. There's now a third volume, but Volume 1 and 2, they were really almost like the Bible for anyone learning the bagpipes. They were the, the music book you would go to. And they contain almost every tune that you will ever want to play. And that came from the army. But as well as that, when you've got nothing to do, when you're outposted in some location around the world, what else do you do than take up your pipes and start composing tunes? And so they would have piping competitions and composition tunes, and, and they would do all manner of stuff. And Highland dancing really picked up at that time as well. Nowadays, you tend to think of it as young girls are dancing. That's the kind of main folk who would do it. But back in the day, it was all the army. So it's interesting how times have moved on. The time of the army really brought about a generation of purely male pipers. You know, back in, I'm from Wick, but my dad used to play in the town band in Thurso. And there was a generation that had come through the army and were all male, which now is starting to change. We've got girls and women starting to join into pipe bands, but it was a very male dominated thing for a long time, mainly because of the army. But yeah, so that, that's kind of the history of piping as best as I know it. It's a wee bit crude and rough around the edges, but I'm sure Dad would be proud. And um, yes, yeah, so do we want a tune? <laughs> yes. Okay, now I haven't played these since this morning. Um, unfortunately, I bashed one of the drones on a door. That sometimes happens when you're carrying them about because they're quite unwieldy instruments. And so we'll have to do what they call a good old tuning to try and make them sound slightly less awful and start to make it sound more like music rather than noise. So without further ado, will we get going? Yep. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> 